Okay, given that I always start everyone else on time, I'm going to start myself on time. So, um, welcome, Eduardo, who's been practice of kind of improvisational, improvisational chair, but I'm basically introducing myself. Um, I'm Mira Salva, most of you know who I am. I normally chair these seminars. Um, I wanted to speak about Sri Lanka because this topic has, this term, brought together everything we've been talking about at the Reuters Institute, and that's the power of platforms, the flow of misinformation, what should be regulated, how news is consumed online and offline, what it means in society to get your news through Facebook and Twitter rather than through the uh, legacy news sites complete, um, directly. And this is an unfolding story. This is still going on. I don't know what the answers are. I don't think there's a kind of conclusion I'm going to draw from this, but I just wanted to raise the situation of Sri Lanka and explain some of the cases to say, I'm kind of deeply unhappy with the direction that the country is going in at the moment, and I'm, I feel quite strongly that there's a debate happening internationally about the role of Facebook in spreading hate speech in these kind of societies that's not being understood fully, um, and the view from the ground is very different from the view in New York, which is different again from California and New Delhi, and so I'm very happy to have this open as a discussion. Like I said, this is a work in progress in the country, but I just thought this is, um, I'm basically using the chair's privilege to talk about something that I think needs to be raised. So this is Sri Lanka, just completely geographically. It's a very small island, very close proximity to India, which has had ongoing consequences for its worldview. It's strategically very important. It's got deep water ports. It's on major shipping lanes. It's a very good um, spot for satellite technology, which will explain why some of the kind of superpowers are interested in it. I'm from the north, Jaffna, that can dot up there. It's the epicenter of the civil war. You can see there how quickly the north can get cut off. It's basically a peninsula. So if you look there, you know, if you cut off this tiny strip of land, you can choke off the north of the country, which is politically, linguistically, religiously very different from most of the island. I'm Tamil, just to take an interest, which means that my people, if you want to say, are centered around this strip of island. Um, the attacks that happened at Easter Sunday happened all over the place. They happened in Nagombo, Colombo, Batukalo. They were kind of spread across the island. Interestingly, not up there, not in the north. Um, and so I basically, thought we would move back. We left in 1983 when the Civil War began. For most people who know anything about Sri Lanka, that just tells the whole story of your life in one sentence. We never thought we were going to be immigrants, expatriates, whatever. We always thought we were going to sit out of war and move back. And um, gradually it became really, really clear that this wasn't going to happen. So then you kind of built a life in Britain. And you know, I went to British schools with lovely English teachers and thought, I like writing and I want to be a journalist. And it's, you know, pitch battles with my parents, um, not just because they wanted me to be a doctor, but because <laughs> this, it's not a great place to be a journalist at all. Um, the media has been weaponized by both sides during the conflict. Any dissent, any criticism brought down disproportionate violence by the government, the Tamil Tigers, everyone. Journalists were attacked on all sides for being too critical, for not being complimentary enough, for being silent, for speaking out, for being in the line of fire. Um, some of you will recognise Marie Colvin there. Um, she wasn't killed in Sri Lanka, as you well know, she was killed in Syria, but she did lose her eye in the crossfire there. Um, and keep note of some of these faces, because I'll, I'll name them. But the, basically, the Committee to Protect Journalists committed to protect journalists say that 60, 19 journalists have been killed since 1992. Like I said, this doesn't tell the whole picture, because other journalists have been violently attacked, threatened, intimidated. The killings, when they do occur, are incredibly gory and designed to scare. They're designed to send out a message, not just to silence the journalists, but to warn their colleagues that this could happen to you as well. So anyway, I went into journalism and I managed for most of my career to not write about Sri Lanka, because it's always easier to be a correspondent in a place when you're not reporting about other people's war and suffering. And in the meantime, the war did end, finally, but in 2009. Um, and it was a very brutal, very bloody end to the war going back to that one, it basically focused on a uh, massacre on the beaches in this strip of the country. And just before the massacre, the journalists, international media were banned from reporting on the war zone. UN, NGO sectors, were, workers were forced out of the country. So it was a war that was deliberately fought away from public eyes. Any kind of critical voices were, were expelled. Um, since then, there has been some kind of reconciliation in fits and starts. There's been um, change of government that was 
seen as bringing in a kind of a new hopeful era. There was some sense of progress. The government promised to remove wartime legislation. There were some inquiries and trials set up over the murder and disappearance of some of the journalists. Um, kind of sense of maybe there might be some kind of hope. And then we had that. And this was Easter Sunday. This was this Easter Sunday. So I just got back from a work trip to Japan. So I kind of jet lagged and you know, reading the news and was watching this in kind of utter horror unfolding. I won't go into the details. I think you all remember this, but there were basically a series of bombs went off in churches and hotels around the country, killing children, families who were worshipping, um, lots of holiday makers, some awful stories. And um, in the end, there were at least 257 people killed. And this is a post-conflict society, remember, and this is the worst attack since the end of the Civil War. And I think absolutely everybody who had any connection with Sri Lanka was just holding their breath to see what happens next, what, 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 what do we do from this point on. And then incredibly, the first actions the government did, the tangible actions, were declare a state of emergency, which is kind of understandable in these circumstances, and ban social media. Now, there's been a global narrative building about how some social media platforms spread hate and misinformation and how engineers coding the algorithms are unwilling to address the problem. So when the government imposed this ban, there was a kind of general wave of approval from many sides, from the New York Times and others, that yes, of course, Facebook was irresponsible, needed to be contained. These attacks, which were against the Christian community, which are a minority in Sri Lanka, were possibly the attacks, uh, the acts of Islamic extremists, and there was a Muslim community and they needed protection. It was kind of a slightly confused reason we are approving of this message, but they did approve. And of course, this is the reason why this is Myanmar. And Myanmar is a kind of different case, but it really fed into the narrative of Sri Lanka, and I've heard so often now that Sri Lanka and Myanmar are the same, which I'll come into in a minute, they're not. But in Myanmar, um, the military drove more than 720,000 Rohingya into Bangladesh, while de really dehumanising material about the stateless group was spread on Facebook, um, and Facebook was incredibly slow to take down these problematic pages. Um, the key thing is that people keep putting them in the same category and saying because these events happened in Myanmar and Facebook had a certain level of culpability, the same obviously applies to Sri Lanka, and it's, that's too simplistic. Um, one thing I keep hearing is that Facebook is the internet in both these countries, in, in, and in Myanmar it's the idea that you buy a mobile phone, Facebook is downloaded, it's the app, and that's how you access the internet. That's not the case in Sri Lanka. It's a more digitally developed society. People, people know Google. People know search engines. They know there are aggregators. There are, it's kind of more sophisticated digital society. Facebook is still very important. I've got data on that. But it's not this idea that Facebook is the internet. It's a bit simplistic and doesn't tell you the whole story. Um, I mean, also Sri Lanka crucially has the highest literacy rate in South Asia. It's a literate population, of the highly educated. And there have been signs of a kind of strong, digitally focused civil society emerging since 2009 and the end of the war. And this civil society looks at women's rights, LGBT issues, and crucially, inter-ethnic dialogue. And this dialogue was mainly in English, which was a common language between all the groups. And because it was in English, it focused on socio socioeconomic groups and in urban centres, so it was limited. But it was the beginnings of a kind of truly national conversation. The local language in social media um, in, in Singular and Tamil is very different, it's very divided, and it reflects the ethnic tension and mistrust expressed in mainstream media. So again, even within social media, there are two types of social media. There's the English social media, which is overall more progressive and can speak to a kind of younger pan-national audience, and then there's the kind of linguistically divided social media, which can be excellent and can be terrible, the same as content everywhere. And just to give you some a few examples of some of the campaigns that really spread on social media at this time, the I Voted campaign, which was used during the local election campaign in, 20, in February 2018, um, and um, together with the kind of LG Poll SL, which had lots of first-time voters sharing photos of themselves. And again, remember, this is, this is the generation that have come into adulthood in peacetime for the first time in a very long time, so it's a very powerful moment. Um, activists in civil society has used the disappeared SL hashtags, disappeared Sri Lanka, to draw attention to and track the protests by families of the disappeared in the north, the people that have disappeared during the conflict. And um, there's been 150 years, um, hashtag to mark 150 years of Ceylon tea, and that's been used partly as kind of celebratory hashtag, but also to mark the plight of upcountry Tamils, which are another kind of minority group that have been quite badly served in society. 
So I kind of felt very strongly that none of this was feeding into the narrative of social media in Sri Lanka in the wake of the Easter Sunday attacks. And I want to look at this in, into this a little bit more. And because if you look at it, the, the war ended in 20, 2009. Until 2016, 17, you had a kind of bumpy but fairly linear progression path towards peace. And then in 2018, to be honest, everything started going a little weird. Um, in October 2018, and this was the kind of the, the weirdest part, but it's not the only thing, uh, the president, Madhpala Sirisena, who won on a kind of unity ticket, sparked a constitutional crisis when he effectively tried to overturn the results of the election and replace the sitting prime minister, Anil Vikramasinghe, um, with the former president, Rajapaksa, who had been the president who presided over the country during the kind of very brutal end of the civil war. And as Rajapaksa's um, supporters seized control of the country's state media, journalists ended up taking to Twitter to document what's going on. So immediately you saw uh, what social media um, was doing. And the coup, attempted coup, constitutional coup, only ended after street protests by citizens and strong opposition from parliamentarians. And both, face, uh, both groups used Facebook to organise and mobilise themselves. And quite hilariously, this was a parliamentary brawl that was recorded um, on Facebook. And go and look at it, just type in Google, um, Sri Lanka parliamentary brawl into Google, and you'll see this fight between MPs in Parliament. And what you'll also see is they're all holding mobile phones, all videoing each other. <laughs> so social media was being used to firstly get you inside Parliament and give you a very different view of what was going on to what state media at that time was doing. Um, there were also other events in 20, uh, 2018 which raised cause for concern, and this is when things start going surreal. Because in February, so earlier that year, there were viral messages on Facebook that police had found 23,000 sterilization pills from a Muslim pharmacy in the east of the country, and that there was a plot that Muslims, who tended to be Tamil, by the way, they tended to speak Tamil as their first language, but they didn't always identify as Tamil later, they often spoke both languages, that there was a plot for Muslims to wipe out Buddhists, and the Buddhists are the national majority, the Sinhalese Buddhists. And then there was kind of a slightly weird incident where a group of singular men went to a restaurant and found powder on the food and asked quite aggressively if the owner had put these pills, the powdered pills, onto the food. And the owner, talk about language, didn't fully understand what he was saying. He did speak some singular, but just didn't understand. So he said something along the lines of, yes, what, I put powder? You know, just like, what's going on? That was videoed, taken as confirmation that he had, in fact, put these powdered up pills on the food, and then he was beaten up. And his admission was also recorded on a mobile phone that was then uploaded to Facebook. And a Facebook group called the Buddhist Information Centre pushed out the video as proof that there was a kind of Muslim conspiracy to, to sterilise the national population. Um, the powder was just flour. It was chapatis and it was just lumps of flour. So it was bad cooking, but not um, attempt to sterilise anything, anyone. And this is a kind of incident that spread via Facebook, but this kind of madness is not new to Sri Lanka. There's a few people who know the country well, but you know, these kind of pogroms, these kind of outbreaks against an ethnic group happen all the time. And you know, it happened in 1958, in 1977, happened in 1983 against the Tamils in Colombo. That's what started the war. So these kind of outbreaks of madness were happening before. This time they happened through, uh, you know, using Facebook as a channel, but they happened before. And at the same time, round about that time, there's a really interesting report done by um, three writers who I refer to quite a lot in this work, with um, Sanjana Hatatowa, Yudhanel Vijaratna, and Rasman Sarato on Twitter bots that suddenly popped up in Sri Lanka at the time, um, round about the time of these anti-Muslim sentiments and rioting. And activists and journalists on Twitter, including the authors themselves, suddenly found themselves being followed by thousands of bots. They had Tamil, singular, Muslim-sounding names, but they basically did nothing. They just followed people, and they followed. This is the kind of cloud they made of the people they followed. And you, I don't speak to recognize the names, but they're basically leading diplomats, ambassadors, civil society organizations, journalists, cricketers, people who have kind of high profile in Sri Lanka. I think Bill Gates is in there somewhere, um, but he's there because um, he's, I think he's a default that Twitter recommends you follow when you open a Twitter account. But, but so th this was a cloud of people that were suddenly being followed by thousands of Twitter bots. Um, Groundviews, one of the civil society news sites that um, set up, that tracked this, set up a kind of use the Twitter unfollow tool to you know, enable people to unfollow these bots, but it was just an odd thing. And at the time, the author said they didn't know what these bots were being created for, but probably thought they were going to be weaponized in the future to control or shape political discourse around key electoral processes or, or reform. We just don't know. And 
as far as I know, there's still no real sense of where these came from. But remember, these are, these are bots. Um, and I'm going to pause for a minute here to just talk a little bit about the media landscape in Sri Lanka. And if you look at the media landscape in Sri Lanka, you're going to see that it's quite divided quite significantly by language. This is a very brief look. Um, there are a reasonable, reasonable number of media outlets, but very few that speak with much credibility over the island to the whole population. They're, it's a very polarised society. Um, if you read Udayan, you're unli unlikely to read Vilamanina. You know, it's just, you're, you're going to pick one of these. And so the messages you're going to get are very different. Um, and, you know, Sri Lanka does not do well in the World Press Freedom Index, and a lot of the reason is this, and it does come up pretty well, but it's to do with media ownership. This is a Reporters Without Borders um, graph, and you'll see just what state control there is over most of the media here. Seven out of 12 print outlets are owned directly by former or current members of parliament, another th two through their family members. Over half of all radio is owned by members of parliament or their family members, and on TV, Four out of 12 are directly controlled by the state, while another two, at least, by family members. So at least 50% of the media in each sector is pretty directly controlled by, by individuals very, very closely connected to or in government. So this is not an independent media space. And the outlets um, that are not somehow affiliated with the establishment are routinely attacked by the establishment for being traitors, liars, unpatriotic. So that's the kind of media space. And then this is where we're operating digitally. Again, just to give you an idea of, um, of where we are, 31% internet penetration, as you'd expect, mainly in urban areas, 5.5 million Facebook subscribers, 26 of the population, and 30%. Um, so basically, if you're, on, if you're online, you're on social media. Mobile phone usage, you know, 137% of the population. Virtually everybody, you know, everyone plus has at least one mobile phone. So it's, it's what it is everywhere else. It's mobile, it's social media, it's urban, but mobile, you know, cheap data. It's also got the seventh de cheapest data in the world. And it's really interesting, this is a kind of completely separate study that I look at, you know, look at, you're looking at the correlation between press freedom, misinformation, in internet blackdowns, government authoritarianism and the price of data is quite, a, it's quite an interesting thing. Um, now, the population of Sri Lanka overall is quite young, so one third are between 20 and 40 years of group, and this group are heavy users of t Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, instant messaging. The most computer literate of these tend to be in the urban centres, and they're electorally active. They're more likely to vote in regional and national elections. And the Centre for Policy Alternatives, which is a group in Sri Lanka, carries some interesting research on how this group share news. And this is from 2016, so a little bit old. But while Facebook is the most important source for news, if they read something interesting, 56% of them were likely to share it via email. Only 18% would said they would share it via social media. So while Facebook might be the place they get news, at that point, it was two years ago, it's not the main place they spread news. That was still email. And obviously it's going to kind of change, but it, it's not a given that if you read something on Facebook, that's where you share it. Um, the digital news report for, uh, from the Reuters Institute for the Time reported that 44% of people worldwide use Facebook for news and 24% of them use social media to share it. So if you look at it in that context, it's kind of understandable that Sri Lankan government shut down social media for around nine days after the Easter attacks, ostensibly to stop hate speech in the wake of these, um, in the wake of these attacks. But firstly, it didn't really work. The hate messages still spread via text messages, VPNs, and it also became quite clear that social media was the least of it. There were massive intelligence failures that led to the attacks. There was a breakdown in communications between the Office of the President and the Prime Minister, unsurprising given that the President had tried to oust the Prime Minister about six months earlier. Um, there were lots of questions that people had that just weren't um, being answered. And also, just look at the results. If you say that you shut down Facebook to stop anti-Muslim Muslim sentiment spreading around the country, well, there's been a whole spate of anti-Muslim riots and a huge groundswell of anti-Muslim sentiment in the wake of the attacks. There have been internet, bla um, been internet blackouts, but they've been accompanied by curfews and mob violence that I remember really well from all the years in Sri Lanka. Again, this is not new. There have also been, um, there's also been a state of emergency that hasn't been lifted. Um, giving people, the police, quite sweeping powers to detain people. And the attacks have not stopped, and there's really no sense that the rule of law in the country is getting worse. Um, it's getting a lot better. Work, uh, it's not, it, no sense that the rule of law is getting better at all. It's getting worse. And then I'm going to unpick this case. This is, um, I'm going to say his name, I'm not very, I'm Sri Lankan, but I still can't say his name properly. Um, it's Dr. Saigun Shihabuddin Muhammad Shafi. 
and he's a doctor in Kurunegala Hospital in the west of the country. And his story shows both why social media may be regulating, but why it also can't be done from isolation in the mainstream media. In late May, a singular language newspaper published a story that a doctor with links to the radical Muslim group, the National Fawi Jamath, which who are accused of um, coordinating these to Sunday attacks, had, again, sterilized 4,000 Sinhalese women and that police were investigating and the sterilization was meant to have happened at this hospital. A university professor, a singular university professor at the hospital posted the story on Facebook, tagging Dr. Shafi, not, not quite accusing him, the link was a little tenuous, it was kind of a slightly complimentary link, but the comments underneath that Facebook page were really vicious um, against him. The police in the meantime issued a statement that they were not aware of any of this, they were not investigating, they had no clue, you know, no evidence of any kind of forced sterilization. But the next day, uh, Dr. Shafi was arrested, not for sterilization, but for um, amassing undeclared assets under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. His colleagues spoke out for him, but he's, he was still in custody. His wife, who was also a doctor at the hospital, and his three children have gone into hiding. And when tracked down, um, the quote I had from her, which said, um, which I didn't get the Sri Lankan media got, which is, I don't know what the future will hold for my family. I don't think things will go back to normal and fall back into place, even if my husband is proved innocent. The media has killed us. Just as an aside for, you know, globally trust in the media, the role of the media in society, but this is incredibly powerful. And, um, and the police chief in charge of the region is now being investigated for his role in the whole operation. It's a very confused story um, that was exacerbated by social media, but it was an interplay between social media and mainstream media. And the upshot of it is nobody is coming out well. And while the police first say there was no link, he was still arrested. So there's an establishment link here as well. I won't, there are all sorts of theories which I won't go into because they'll think, but um, there's no sense that this, is, this happened only because it was posted on Facebook, basically. And also, crucially, while, this, uh, while Dr. Shafi is still in custody, this man is out. And for those of you who don't know, this is Galgal Gautne Nanasera, and he's head of, head of a hardline Buddhist group called Bodha Balasena, or the Buddhist Power Force. He has close links with Ratu, the uh, extremist monk in Myanmar, who's been vocal in attacking the Rohingya community there. He had been jailed in August 2016 for contempt of court when he interrupted a court hearing about the abduction of a journalist, Pragith Ekn Aligoda who was a critic of the government, who went missing in 2010. He was also in this slide. The trial, which happened in 2016, remember, when Sri Lanka was still trying to kind of have this post-reconciliation, post-conflict reconciliation, was looking at the role the military intelligence officers made have played in his disappearance. The monk um, shouted at the presiding judge and the lawyers as the accused military men were refused bail. The same day, he also threatened the um, Pragit's wife. I mean, Pragith was mainly a cartoonist. He depicted issues of media freedom, political power, social disadvantage. He was a well-known critic of Rajapaksa. So where we are now? Pragith is still missing. Now, Skanasera is out of prison. Rajapaksa looks like he might well be in power soon. You would understand why I think social media is only a very, very small part of the problem in Sri Lanka, and why blocking it is going to create a whole set of problems that we can't even begin to anticipate. And I'm going to end just with this. And this is... Um, a slide that I took from a lecture given by Rasmus Nielsen, who is now the director of the Institute, who was then head of research. Um, he gave a lecture here in this room last year about platform power, and he argued that large tech companies have hard power, soft power, and as listed here, platform power. And the platform power is power to set standards, power to make or break connections, power of automated action at scale, power of secrecy, power that operates across domains. And I remember thinking at the time, gosh, what an amazing set of powers. Wouldn't any authoritarian government love to have this? And what I really feel is that what's happening in Sri Lanka is in trying to attack the platforms and dismantle the space that social media provides for criticism and dissent. They're trying to seize these powers from platforms. And as an international community, we just need to be aware of the fact that this is happening when we kind of talk about regulation and where this fits into the narrative. So thank you.